So Dr. Lee's talk is going to be about 45 to 50 minutes, and we're going to ask to uh, jot down any questions that you have. Um, you can also put them in the chat, but um, we will leave the questions after the talk. It's all yours, Dr. Lee. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, and thank you to um, Lindsay and Amal, the SDE Klogan organizers to invite me to give this talk. Thank you for the opportunity to share my research on implicit language aptitude, um, which refers to um, the abilities for unconscious second language learning. Uh, I, um, I hope you guys, um, um, I mean, uh, this talk will help you know a little bit more about the cognitive foundations of second language acquisition and also about what we do um, in our field. <laughs> Um, again, thank you for making time to attend this talk. Um, let me get started. Um, if you have questions, if we don't have time for um, all the questions in the Q&A session, um, feel free to email me. I provided my email address on the first slide. Okay, so uh, given that the topic is implicit language aptitude, um, I'd like to start by providing some background information about um, language aptitude. So what do we mean by language aptitude? Um, well, language aptitude refers to a set of um, cognitive abilities, which are predictive of learning rate and ultimate uh, attainment in a second language. So other things being equal, those with stronger aptitude learn faster and they're more likely to achieve native-like proficiency. So basically it refers to intelligence for language learning, uh, which is different from general intelligence, um, something that I will address later on. Um, what are the components of language aptitude? So I call it traditional aptitude because later on I'm going to differentiate um, implicit aptitude and traditional aptitude. But um, for the moment, let's just um, use the term um, aptitude. <laughs> um, um, there are three components for language aptitude. One is called phonetic coding ability, which refers to um, the ability to recognize and mimic sounds. So supposedly, this kind of ability is important for learning second language pronunciation. Um, and then there is uh, language analytic ability, which refers to the ability to learn the morphosyntactic aspects of a second language or the ability to learn grammar. And then the third uh, component is called associative or rote memory, uh, which enables learners to memorize the associations between words and their meanings. And um, hypothetically, this kind of ability is important for lexical learning or learning vocabulary. So we have three aspects covered here. Uh, the abilities for pronunciation learning, grammar learning, and uh, vocabulary learning. Um, although, I mean, they, they, um, there's no perfect one-to-one um, -one correspondence between uh, those three skills and the three components. Uh, but theoretically, uh, the three components um, help us understand what language aptitude is. Right. Um, so um, as for characteristics of language aptitude, it has been um, conceived as a stable trait, but um, research has demonstrated that it increases with age and also language learning experience. Um, so um, older learners and more experienced learners tend to have higher aptitude scores. Um, the research also shows that um, language aptitude overlaps with intelligence, which refers to um, cognitive abilities for school learning, for academic learning, um, but it's um, dissociable or separable from general intelligence. So language learning is something special. Uh, it involves uh, domain-specific cognitive abilities. Those who um, have high intelligence are not necessarily uh, successful language learners and vice versa. 
um, aptitude is um, uncorrelated with motivation, um, negatively correlated, correlated with anxiety, and it's also different from working memory. Although there has been a call to include working memory as a component of language aptitude, um, there are different things. Um, okay, let me um, talk more about language aptitude. Uh, or traditional aptitude. Um, so commonly used measures of aptitude include the MLAB, PLAB, HILAB, uh, Canal F, so on and so forth. So there have been a lot of tests that have been used in the field to measure language aptitude. Among these tests, the MLAB or Modern Language Aptitude Test is the um, most predictive of learning outcomes. So it has um, the, the strongest predictive power on learning outcomes, but it's no longer available to researchers. The company that owns the um, copyright stopped um, selling the test to researchers because they can't make a lot of money because um, researchers are poor, right? <laughs> and the, the LAMA test is uh, the most popular uh, test, aptitude test in the research in recent research um, because uh, it's free, it's short, it, it only takes 30 minutes to complete um, and it's freely downloadable. Um, and of course, it's also because the MLAT uh, is no longer available. All right, in terms of the predictive power of language aptitude or the associations between aptitude and learning outcomes, um, language aptitude has been found to be a strong predictor of um, second language proficiency with the average uh, correlation of uh, uh, 0.5, which is a strong effect or strong correlation uh, based on benchmarks, both in psychology and in second language acquisition research. This constitutes a strong effect. Um, it's more important for beginning or initial language learning than learning that happens at more advanced stages. Um, and traditional aptitude is also important, more important for adult learners than child language learners in naturalistic settings, in settings where um, the second language is spoken in the community, uh, like learning English in the US uh, would be a naturalistic setting. Um, there is an interface between aptitude and inductive and deductive instruction. More specifically, um, high aptitude learners benefit more from uh, inductive instruction and low aptitude learners benefit more from deductive instruction. Um, and um, uh, importantly, uh, language aptitude has been found to be more strongly correlated with the effects of explicit instruction than the effects of implicit instruction, um, which is why we're trying to um, conceptualize and validate implicit language aptitude. Okay, to contextualize the discussion of implicit language aptitude, um, I would like to distinguish two kinds of learning, um, explicit and implicit learning. Um, explicit learning uh, is characterized by effortful and conscious information processing. Implicit learning um, is characterized by um, unconscious computation of the relationships between uh, materials that are available in the environment. So I like to make a, a comparison between the characteristics of the two kinds of learning. Um, so explicit learning is conscious. Um, um, we are aware of the process and the outcomes of learning. Um, it is more recent in human evolution. Um, it's rule-based, uh, analytic, rational, uh, it happens quickly, so it's more efficient compared with implicit learning. It's flexible, which means that the uh, learning outcomes are transferable between different knowledge domains uh, and between different skills. Um, the effects are short-lived or not endurable. Um, so you learn it quickly, but then you also lose it quickly. <laughs> easy come, easy go. 
Um, and um, axe-based learning is subject to individual variation. So there's a lot of individual variation in axe-based learning. Um, on the other hand, implicit learning is unconscious, which means that um, uh, we are not aware that learning happened, although it, it did happen. <laughs> We're not aware of the process and also the product, the outcome of learning. Um, it's evolutionarily more primitive um, in human his, uh, history. Uh, it's data-driven, which means that it requires a lot of uh, exposure, a lot of um, input uh, and repeated practice. Um, it's intuitive, it's based on tacit feelings or gut feelings, um, not rational thinking. Um, it happens slowly uh, and the learning outcomes are not flexible, cannot be uh, transferred between different knowledge domains or skills. Um, the effects are more sustainable. Uh, so once you learn it um, and then you, you'll not lose it, you, you'll uh, keep it, <laughs> retain it for a long period of time without forgetting, although it happens slowly. Uh, and there is a lack of individual differences. So in general, implicit learning um, is more homogeneous compared with explicit learning. Okay, so is there any empirical evidence for the separation between the two kinds of learning? The answer is yes. There has been robust evidence that shows that these two kinds of learning are fundamentally different. Um, for example, uh, the research uh, shows that explicit learning abilities such as uh, associative memory and um, reasoning, um, which are typically tested by using traditional intelligence tests, and those kinds of abilities are um, uncorrelated or sometimes even neg negatively correlated with uh, the effects of implicit learning tasks. They are only correlated with the effects of explicit learning tasks, but not with the effects of um, implicit instruction. Okay, another piece of evidence which is relevant to what my colleagues are doing <laughs> um, in special ed is that um, the research found that individuals with cognitive impairments in explicit learning, such as those who suffer from autism and uh, amnesia, they have intact implicit learning abilities. And on the other hand, those who have impairments in implicit learning abilities, such as um, um, individuals who suffer from dyslexia, um, they have intact explicit learning abilities. So this is another piece of evidence that shows that these two kinds of learning are separable. Um, all right. Um, so, um, let me focus on implicit language aptitude, which is a cutting edge topic, <laughs> both in psychology and uh, second language acquisition research. Um, the idea of implicit learning is not new, but the idea of implicit learning as a predictor of learning outcomes is a new um, concept. So, um, Previous research has primarily focused, focused on whether learning can happen unconsciously or implicitly. Um, it's a recent initiative to investigate implicit learning as a cognitive ability. So um, based on this notion, um, individuals are uh, different in terms of their abilities for conscious um, or and unconscious learning. Some people are good at picking up um, languages. For example, um, they um, may not understand grammar rules, um, but somehow um, they learned, <laughs> although they didn't realize that they, they, they learned something. Um, other people may be good at um, conscious learning. They may have stronger um, analytic abilities. Um, so the idea is implicit learning can be um, a, a predictor, a cognitive ability, which is important for learning outcomes. And this is my definition of implicit language aptitude. Um, 
So implicit aptitude refers to cognitive abilities for unconscious computation of distributional and transitional probabilities, uh, which sound very abstract, but I'll explain later what they mean. Um, recent initiatives on implicit aptitude in our field include a special issue of um, uh, a journal called uh, Studies in Second Language Acquisition, which is a good journal in our field. I co guess I, I did this thematic issue with uh, 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 Robert De Kaiser um, from University of Maryland. I also organized a colloquium at the annual conference of American Association of, of Applied Linguistics. Um, all right. So uh, next, I would like to talk about the uh, role of implicit language aptitude in major um, second language acquisition theories. Um, I have to announce or clarify that these theories um, actually don't make overt claims about language aptitude or implicit aptitude. Uh, the claims I'm talking about are based on my inferences of their claims about how learning happens. So um, uh, the credit should be given to me. <laughs> um, but um, so uh, based on uh, usage-based um, approaches to second language acquisition, um, language learning is primarily an unconscious process. Um, um, it's primarily based on learners unconscious tallying of the cues regarding the relationships between linguistic units. And this theory also says that um, language learning is a matter of sequence learning, which has been um, conceptualized as a component of um, implicit language aptitude. So language learning involves the learning of sequences, sequences of songs and syllables and, and words. Um, and this theory also says that um, explicit learning may happen, may be necessary uh, for certain aspects of second language learning, such as learning um, um, certain aspects of vocabulary. Um, and um, it may also provide materials for implicit learning. Um, but uh, fundamentally, language learning is an unconscious process. Even when explicit learning happens, the purpose is to um, help learners e e uh, establish initial constructions, which will be processed unconsciously thereafter. The interaction hypothesis um, holds a, a similar view, but um, um, it's a slightly different. Um, um, however, in this theory, uh, implicit aptitude also plays uh, a major role, a very important role in second language acquisition. So based on this theory, learning is um, optimal, is ideal when input is detected initially and then processed later. So um, implicit aptitude is at its best when aided by low levels of awareness. So this level of awareness um, does not involve uh, um, effortful uh, uh, and uh, conscious information processing. Um, it may just involve or, um, or require um, uh, perception or uh, registration of the linguistic stimuli. Um, according to skill acquisition theory, um, the two kinds of aptitude, explicit aptitude and implicit aptitude play different roles at different stages of second language acquisition. Um, explicit aptitude or explicit uh, cognitive abilities are more important at the initial stages of learning and uh, implicit aptitude uh, plays a more important role at more advanced stages when um, um, uh, 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 sorry, declarative knowledge is procedurized and automatized. Okay, um, let me summarize the uh, major theoretical claims regarding the role of implicit language aptitude. First, um, as with uh, explicit aptitude or similar to explicit aptitude, implicit aptitude makes an independent contribution to second language acquisition. Um, 
implicit aptitude is more important or is might be more amenable to the learning of complex linguistic structures, whereas explicit aptitude may have a, a larger effect on um, simple linguistic structures. Implicit aptitude um, is more likely to be drawn upon at uh, advanced stages of learning. Explicit aptitude is um, more likely to be implicated in initial stages of learning. Okay. Um, based on the double dissociation hypothesis, implicit and explicit aptitude are implicated in implicit and explicit instruction or learning conditions, respectively. Um, that is, uh, implicit aptitude is only or more strongly correlated with uh, implicit inst instruction, and explicit aptitude um, is more strongly correlated or is only correlated with the uh, effects of explicit instruction. Okay, other things being equal, implicit aptitude may be more important for grammar learning, whereas explicit aptitude um, is more likely. Um, to be drawn upon in lexical or vocabulary learning. Okay, implicit aptitude may um, contribute directly to implicit, implicit knowledge. Explicit aptitude may um, lead to implicit aptitude indirectly, um, such as by providing materials um, for implicit learning or the learning of implicit knowledge. Okay, next. Um, so implicit aptitude is a new concept. Uh, what components are um, should be included, or what uh, component components it uh, contains? Uh, it's uh, an open question. Um, based on my reading of the literature, my experience with the research, um, a core component is learners' sensitivity to distributional stati statistics which refers to frequency, the number of times an, an, an event take, uh, happens. And um, also um, it refers to sensitivity to a transitional probability, which refers to the um, consistency and strength of the um, um, re relationships regarding the co-occurrence of events. So it's a matter of, um, um, how likely one event uh, can be predicted by another event, can be preceded by or followed by another unit. Another um, component could be selective attention, um, which refers to the ability to select relevant um, linguistic input. So the main function is to select, uh, it's not to store information. It does not require mental capacity for inf effortful uh, conscious information processing. It may only involve low levels of awareness. Um, right. Um, so um, what tests can be used to measure implicit language aptitude? Um, uh, in the literature, implicit aptitude has been measured as sequence learning, um, which in turn is measurable um, by using serial reaction time tasks, Lama D and artificial grammar. Serial reaction time um, is the most popular, uh, most frequently used test in the literature, in the research on uh, implicit uh, learning and implicit aptitude. It has been found to be the most reliable or consistent predictor of learning outcomes. Lama D is another test that has been used in the research, uh, but um, it's an inconsistent predictor of, of uh, learning outcomes. Artificial grammar um, has been used once in my study. Um, and, and typically, learners are asked to uh, memorize uh, some letter strings, and they are asked to recognize old and new strings in the testing phase. Um, the stimuli are typically, uh, typically created um, based on a finite grammar or an artificial grammar. Syntactic priming could be um, another candidate. Um, 
although it was found to be, um, um, not, I mean, it, it was not a predictor of learning outcomes, uh, but there has been only one study. I mean, um, my study is the only study that used this uh, syntactic priming as a measure of implicit language aptitude. Um, so there needs to be more research um, exploring the validity of syntactic priming as a um, measure of implicit language aptitude. Um, other tasks that have been used um, include tasks of uh, process control. Uh, typically in those tests, learners are asked to uh, reach a goal or maintain um, a certain target. Um, and they also receive feedback um, with a view to helping them learn un uh, the regularities unbeknownst to them. Um, okay, so here is an example zero reaction time task, um, which, as I said, is the most popular and also the most consistent um, predictor of um, uh, learning outcomes. So typically in a zero reaction time task, learners are asked to respond to a symbol or, um, or dot. Um, um, in this case, it's a cross that occurs or that um, um, appears on different locations. And these location, locations are based on two number sequences. One is more frequent than the other. And the, uh, the idea is that with repeated practice, um, learners will become faster when they respond to the more uh, frequent um, sequence compared with the control sequence, which is less frequent um, because they unconsciously learn the rules, um, learn the sequences. Um, yeah, so um, typically learner's performance is calculated based on the um, difference scores between their reaction times for more, the more frequent sequence and the less frequent sequence. Okay, this is another example um, test of um, implicit aptitude. Uh, it's, it can be called a measure of procedural memory in cognitive psychology. Um, so in this um, test, learners are asked to uh, follow some rules and uh, move, some, uh, move three balls around from initial state or initial configuration and uh, to the goal state. Um, so the rules could be, uh, you can only move one ball at a time. If there's another ball on top, uh, you can move it. Um, the first pack can accommodate three balls, the second two balls, and the third pack can only hold one ball. Um, so um, it's a measure of the ability to proceduralize, to learn from practice. So the idea is you become faster during the process of completing this task uh, if you do it again and again. And um, you will learn the, the rule, the regularity underlying the stimuli. All right. Um, so um, because of the uniqueness of um, pronunciation learning and the importance of learn, uh, pronunciation learning. In our field, there has been a, um, an independent stream of research investigating implicit and explicit pronunciation aptitude. Um, so the idea is um, there are um, cognitive abilities which are exclusively important for pronunciation learning. And those abilities uh, can be divided into uh, implicit and explicit pronunciation learning abilities um, or pronunciation aptitude. Implicit pronunciation aptitude has been measured by using Lama D and uh, um, an FFR, which is an electrophysiological um, test. Um, explicit pronunciation, pronunciation aptitude has been measured by using uh, some traditional aptitude tests, which um, require learners to recognize sounds or distinguish sounds. 
Um, it's also measurable by using um, tests for musical abilities. So uh, the ability to sing songs, <laughs> to, rec to discriminate musical notes has been found to be a significant predictor of pronunciation learning. Um, this referred to abilities to um, distinguish musical notes, which um, differ in uh, pitch, uh, beat, uh, rhythm, and speed. All right, so um, implicit aptitude is a psychological construct or cognitive construct, and it's measured by psychometric tests. And the validity of the um, tests can be examined um, from different perspectives by collecting evidence um, for divergent validity, uh, convergent validity, and uh, predictive validity. So divergent validity refers to whether measures of implicit aptitude are correlated with each other. I'm sorry. Uh, and, um, divergent validity refers to whether measures of implicit aptitude are different from measures of explicit aptitude because they are they are different. They are uh, hypothesized to be different concepts or different constructs. Uh, they are genetically different. So measures of those two constructs should be uncorrelated or even negatively correlated. And there has been strong evidence for the divergent validity of implicit aptitude. Convergent validity refers to whether the measures of implicit aptitude are correlated with each other because they are uh, genetically connected or similar. They belong to the same family, so they should converge. Um, predictive validity refers to whether implicit aptitude is a predictor of learning outcomes. So um, it's, a, uh, uh, it's fundamental for um, individual difference factors um, because if it is not important for learning outcomes and then um, there's no point in doing research about it. Um, so predictive validity has been examined in um, um, two different settings, uh, naturalistic settings and instructed settings. Um, we'll talk more about those two settings, research uh, conducted under those two settings. Um, and one striking finding about implicit aptitude is its lack of convergent validity. That is, um, all the measures that have been uh, hypothesized to measure implicit aptitude have been found to be uncorrelated with each other. Uh, sometimes they are negatively correlated with each other. <laughs> so that's uh, something that's very um, distinct about implicit aptitude compared with explicit aptitude. So these are the studies which found that uh, measures of implicit aptitude um, were uncorrelated. Or even negatively correlated. So they didn't, they didn't converge. So there may be something wrong, right? something wrong with the measures or something wrong with the concept, or there's nothing wrong. It's just the way it is, <laughs> uh, uh, which means that um, um, that's the nature of implicit aptitude. Um, so I propose a, a modular view of implicit aptitude which means that implicit aptitude is a set of uh, independent cognitive uh, abilities. Uh, they may not be correlated with, the, with each other, um, but they're all important. They may not overlap, but um, all roles lead to Rome. Uh, they, are, they, are, they contribute to learning in different ways, in parallel and independent ways. Okay, um, in terms of predictive validity, um, studies conducted in naturalistic settings, in settings where the second language uh, was spoken in the community um, was the um, language of the country. Um, uh, LAM, uh, SRT and lambda D, which are measures of implicit aptitude were found to be um, associated with the learning outcomes of learners who um, lived in the country for a longer period of time. Um, 
in another in another study, um, SRT, a measure of implicit aptitude, was predictive of um, learning outcomes um, of learners with homogeneous backgrounds recruited from uh, um, intensive language learning uh, institute. Right, um, Granita 2013 found that um, both uh, uh, zero reaction time and lambda D were uh, correlated with the uh, with uh, um, uh, agreement structures such as um, uh, subject verb agreement, but not with the learning of structures involving form meaning mapping such as the subjunctive mood. So um, in this case, whether or not it's predictive of learning outcomes depends on the nature of the linguistic structure. Um, one finding that is strange about lambda D, which is um, hypothesized to be a measure of implicit aptitude, is that um, it's correlated with explicit learning, explicit knowledge, but not with implicit knowledge. So that's why I said earlier that lambda D um, has been found to be an inconsistent predictor of learning outcomes. Okay. Uh, studies conducted in instructional um, settings or with classroom learners can be um, divided into two groups, um, which we can call experimental research and correlational research, depending on whether there is instructional manipulation. So um, in experimental research, the goal is to investigate the interface, the uh, interactions between aptitude or different kinds of aptitude and, uh, and uh, instructional treatments, different kinds of instructional treatment. Okay, um, studies um, based on natural languages found that um, SRT was predictive of the effects, the effects of implicit instruction, but not the effects of explicit instruction. Um, so confirming the so-called double association hypothesis, uh, that is implicit and explicit aptitude are associated with learning outcomes uh, that happen in um, implicit and explicit learning conditions re respectively. Studies conducted with um, artificial languages revealed that um, process control tax, uh, tasks were predictive of um, advanced learning, learning that happened at more uh, at advanced stages of learning, but not with initial learning. Okay, um, correlational research that uh, did not examine um, or did not include um, instructional treatments um, um, basically uh, revealed that um, implicit aptitude was predictive of learning outcomes. Um, including high proficiency and um, implicit knowledge, knowledge involved in oral production, um, and um, uh, more advanced um, second language proficiency. So in these studies, there was no instructional treatment. Um, researchers just um, tested students' aptitude and their second language proficiency, and then they did the correlation type of uh, analysis like um, regression correlations. Um, basically, these studies confirmed the um, theoretical claims about language uh, implicit aptitude. So implicit aptitude uh, was import important for um, learning for second language proficiency. Okay, so um, at this point, I'd like to um, uh, bring up the um, um, a, a, a separate stream of research relating to age and language aptitude. What time is it? Uh, okay, I think I can skip a few slides. <laughs> so we're running out of time. Um, but I'll, I'll um, go through the slides very quickly. Um, so um, there's a theory about AD effects um, in second language acquisition called um, critical period hypothesis, um, which um, led to the so-called fundamental difference hypothesis. Um, according to this theory, 
um, children and adults learn uh, languages differently. Children have implicit learning abilities or implicit aptitude, which allows them to um, learn a language, whether it's first language or second language, unconsciously, uh, quickly, and easily. Um, adults, however, have lost that kind of ability. We have to rely on domain general. Well, I don't think it's domain general. It's, it's still about language learning. Uh, so uh, we have to rely on conscious learning abilities uh, or analytic learning abilities, which are conscious in nature. However, um, the th theoretical claims um, have not been confirmed in research. So research findings have undermined these claims. Um, uh, the research shows that both, I mean, adults have stronger implicit and explicit aptitude. So compared with children, we are stronger in both conscious and unconscious learning. Um, implicit aptitude is important for both uh, child and adult second language acquisition. Um, the findings about explicit aptitude are mixed. Um, so uh, one study found that um, it was only uh, it was correlated with both child and adult second language learning, uh, and um, other studies showed that uh, explicit aptitude was only important for adult second language learning. Okay, so um, there are disparities between theories between this theory, uh, the fundamental difference hypothesis, and research findings. Um, I would like to propose two explanations for the disparities. One is that adults may have lost some aspects of implicit aptitude, but not all of it. Um, so we still have uh, uh, cognitive abilities for unconscious learning. We can still learn unconsciously although we have lost the magical power um, um, for children, possessed by children, that uh, allows language learning to be um, uh, efficient and easy. Um, another possible explanation is that the kind of implicit aptitude measured by using SRT and other psychometric tests um, is not the magical power um, own by, uh, I mean, children have. Um, so they may only measure domain general cognitive abilities for implicit learning. And that kind of ability is different from the domain specific language learning ability that the children have. Okay, so pedagogical implications. Um, how can we apply the concept and research findings about language aptitude and um, uh, implicit aptitude in particular to the practice of uh, uh, learning, of language learning and language teaching. Um, aptitude scores traditionally have been used to, to select learners, uh, to screen learners to find the um, 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 most uh, successful learners or learners who, who have the largest potential to be successful learners by state funded programs. So um, especially in the uh, 50s and uh, 60s, the US government sponsored a lot of language programs and they wanted to so select the most capable learners who can succeed within a short period of time. They, they didn't want to waste the money. Um, aptitude tests can be used to diagnose learning disabilities. So if learners have um, extremely um, low scores on aptitude tests, and we can waive foreign language, or we should waive foreign language requirements for those learners. For placement purposes, so when we place learners into different classes, we have to make sure their aptitude profiles are comparable. We can also provide advice in terms of how uh, learners should learn. Um, the idea of implicit aptitude is very useful and valuable because all the current um, aptitude tests are dominated by explicit aptitude. Um, if implicit aptitude 
uh, makes uh, uh, an independent contribution to learning outcomes, then any test uh, without implicit, a component of implicit aptitude is incomplete. Uh, learners who are classified as not having the aptitude or talent for um, language learning based on traditional aptitude tests can be equally successful if they are um, taught in the uh, appropriate ways. Very importantly, we should cater for individual differences by drawing on research findings, such as matching instruction types with learner types. And um, another idea is to use a, a hybrid approach that consists of different um, methods and techniques and resources. So learners with different aptitude profiles can all benefit. Um, so basically we can um, give learners options. Um, and this is one way to cater, <laughs> to accommodate. Okay, that's all. That's all for my presentation. And I hope we still have some minutes for questions. Questions? <laughs> this is the last slide. All right. Um, we have a couple a of people beautiful. with hands up. Shelf, Dr. Lee, are you able to see those or? Oh yeah, I saw Ali and uh, Hilal. Uh, yeah, so Hilal, <laughs> or, yeah, if one of you want to unmute and ask, ask your question. Hello. Uh, hi. Hi, Hilal hi, and um, Ali. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for this great presentation. It was very eye-opening and uh, um, different aspect uh, of implicit, ex explicit uh, discussion. Um, so my coming. question, uh, my question is about the Lama D um, assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, you explained that um, the correlation uh, varied and it was not inconsistent. Uh, it was it was inconsistent. So sometimes it correlated with um, implicit aptitude and sometimes it, um, there was a, um, a positive correlation with the explicit uh, aptitude. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you encountered any research uh, studies um, that looked at the indirect relationship or the indirect pathways um, in structural equation modeling mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm. Yeah, um, I actually did a study recently and published last year. Mm -hmm. um, I used structural equation modeling and I found that lambda D, which is hypothesized to be a measure for implicit aptitude loaded on the same factor with explicit aptitude. So basically uh, it turned out to be a measure of um, explicit learning um, or explicit aptitude. Um, so it's inc very inconsistent in terms of its validity, uh, predictive mm -hmm. and uh, divergent and convergent validity. Uh, the test only has a few items. Um, and then um, I think the way uh, the test is administered uh, encourages learners to engage in conscious information processing. So there are, learners are asked to listen to some songs, artificial syllables, and then they were asked, they, they were told that you're going to be tested. So, and then um, explicit learning will happen, right? If you tell people that they are going to be tested, they'll pay attention and they'll engage in conscious information processing. I think that could be one of the reasons. Um, in, in one of the studies, um, the researcher uh, did something to encourage implicit learning. They, instead of saying you're going to be tested, they ask the participants to listen to the songs uh, and then check the volume um, of the audio file. So in that case, their attention was distracted from um, uh, from the linguistic material or from, from sounds, right? So. Um, mm -hmm. It's more likely to, I mean, that kind of learning can be more likely unconscious. Yeah, that's interesting. Because um, if you build uh, Lama D into a dynamic assessment, 
maybe the results would be different because the um, students would not understand that they are being assessed, but just uh, kind of a part of the mm -hmm. learning process, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe they could mm -hmm. change the results. Just an idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, thank you. Yeah, the, the test needs to be improved. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for your question. So Ali, <laughs> we're in Saudi Arabia <laughs> now. Yeah, hi, and thanks for this interesting presentation. So at the beginning, you mentioned that the uh, wouldn't this make finding the effect of implicit aptitude more difficult because of range restriction? Oh, I think I lost part of your question. Could you repeat your question? Yeah, my question is, at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that uh, people are more homogeneous when it mm. comes to implicit aptitude. Mm. Wouldn't mm. this make it more difficult to find mm -hmm. the effect of implicit aptitude because most people are very similar in it? Uh, mm -hmm. range restriction. Right. Uh, that's a very good point. Indeed, homogeneity is an issue for research on implicit learning, whether it's implicit aptitude or implicit learning in general, um, because they're just not different, right? They're not different enough to um, for researchers to get significant correlations. Um, um, yeah, so that, that's a problem. Um, that's a pro one of the reasons why um, implicit aptitude or implicit cognitive abilities have been um, uh, inconsistent predictors of learning outcomes. Um, and also it's uh, implicit learning, it, because it's unconscious, right? It's hard to catch. Um, you, you cannot tell learners to um, pay attention to uh, learning materials or, 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 or test stimuli. So um, um, the, the it's, it's very hard to test, to, to measure um, implicit learning. Um, yeah, and that's, yeah, I, that's probably one of the reasons why um, and the results for uh, implicit learning have been very, um, very inconsistent. Yeah, I think maybe in the field, and this is one of the um, problems that need to be solved, that is to develop valid, uh, valid measures of implicit learning and implicit aptitude. Okay, yeah, Phil. <laughs> Thanks for the very interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more about some of the underlying characteristics of implicit aptitude. So you mentioned, for example, selective attention. Mm. And we also know that implicit knowledge is meant to be somewhat effortless, that it shouldn't, it shouldn't result in um, effortful attention or encoding of information. But if it's deliberate, its effortfulness goes up and, and therefore it's more selective. So how, how can it be selective without being effortful and deliberate? You know, I was wondering about the trade-off between those characteristics. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So it's one of the ideas um, that is um, controversial uh, and it's also ambiguous, right? Um, so for implicit learning to happen, there has to be a certain degree of uh, awareness and this kind of awareness doesn't have to involve conscious information processing. I mean, just um, um, detection or perception uh, that something is happening might be enough. So um, as I explained, the primary function of selective attention is to select. Um, and if you just notice that something is there, that's enough. Uh, it does not require a deep level of understanding, such as metalinguistic awareness. 
um, but um, a degree or even a shallow level of uh, awareness is necessary. And uh, saying that in, implicit learning happens entirely unconsciously uh, without seeing something, you can learn it. Well, that's to me, that's nonsense. I mean, if you, <laughs> if you don't even see it, how can you learn? So um, some people argue that it has to be completely unconscious. Um, but I think um, a certain um, level of awareness is, is necessary. Um, like, for example, if, if you attend a party, if you um, find someone at the party, oh, uh, uh, he's here or she's here, and that's, that might be enough. <laughs> um, but I know it's, it's, it's hard to measure selective attention. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't think I have a satisfactory answer. Um, but um, in some studies, they included both um, both um, um, test test items for implicit learning and uh, uh, and selective attention, a component of selective attention. For example, you learn something, um, but at the same time, um, you listen to. Um, a toll, um, and then you count the number of um, tolls that you hear. So, um, so the idea is you do two things at the same time, but still you learn. Okay. Can I still ask a question? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, Flavia. Hi, Feng. how are you? Excellent Good. presentation. That's so much. I would have so many questions, but I'm going to ask one question that's more like experiential than research-based. I'm very curious about people who are multilingual, as many of us in this audience are, and how the different languages that we acquired may have been acquired in different ways. And then go back to also language acquisition. Like, let's say, somebody who's completely monolingual and as a child how people learn how to speak and you know and learn how to not only understand but produce the language replicate the language and even if they don't know how to read and write they're able to speak the language so in my case let's say i was i grew up very monolingual i'm from brazil so i speak uh, brazilian portuguese and then in school i was learning english um explicitly <laughs> I also have like a tutor and then all that was some somewhere in my head and I would respond to exams and tests did okay, but I was not able to engage in conversations or use English in terms of producing the language or using the language for socializing, working or anything. Later, I studied more English and came to the US for grad school. And then I was immersed in the environment. So my English progressed like, you know, super fast. Uh, and then many things that I had learned as a child or as an adult learner started to come back and I was able to produce the language. And I can remember the level of stress and anxiety was extremely high as well. Now, moving to other languages, I learned Spanish on the streets, basically working in Spanish speaking countries and with housemates who spoke Spanish and reading Spanish. And then the Spanish came, never took a class very fast, but also Spanish and Portuguese are very close languages. Pronunciations are completely different. So I have to be aware when I'm talking, but 80% of vocabulary is very similar, but there are different languages. And then I took like French and Italian when I was in college. So I'm able to read and understand, but I don't have the conversational skills for Italian and French that I learned in, by explicit means, and I'm able to read and understand somewhat. But the Spanish became completely fluent, never taken a course, so more like the implicit learning. But I also have questions about learning how to learn a second language, and I, my, my husband grew up bilingual French and Arabic. And in our house, we have five languages going on. And my daughter is now learning, she started learning French and Arabic as an adult. And Portuguese, she understands, but she cannot respond. 
and she went to a Spanish immersion school. So it's, it's a big mess in our home, but made me think a lot about multilingualism that we have in the US, like, you know, children who might speak a language at home and speak another language at school, but the process of acquiring languages and language they are similar or not. I can never learn, or I can tell myself that, but I haven't been able to learn any Arabic because for me, it doesn't, I don't have a hook. Now it doesn't relate it to any languages that I already know. So also when you're testing people in the acquisition of a second language, if the sec if it makes a difference, if the second language is related, it comes from the same linguistic roots or the same family of the language of your mother tongue language, or if the language is completely dissociated so that you know, the learning curve is gonna be much harder for to acquire a second language that's not related to your mother tongue language. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. So probably um, implicit learning is more likely to happen when you learn a language that is similar to your own language. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's an interesting topic. Um, so if the two languages are dissimilar and um, it's more likely that learners will learn the second language um, explicitly. Um, yeah, so that's, yeah, I, I guess um, it's, 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 uh, it'll be a, a valuable project to investigate whether implicit and access learning um, happen um, in learning languages um, which are uh, close to, similar to, or different from one's own languages. Or if you have done any studies that you can like to segregate students coming, let's say, mm. Chinese students learning English in school in the US or Spanish speaking students learning uh, English, you know, already immersed in the system and, you know, the level of adaptation, acquisition and producing, pro I mean, producing the language as well. Like, you know, if there is a different rate or a different way that people learn, you know, um, a language that's not associated at all, that the brains cannot make any connections to those languages. Mm -hmm. a different script yeah yeah i guess in your house there's a lot of implicit learning going on <laughs> so basically um um or not going just... on because <laughs> my mother refused to learn anything from us she's learning in school now <laughs> oh really okay <laughs> you said your your house is a mess it's, uh, it's uh, there are multiple languages spoken we mix just some for fun, you know, we say a phrase with multiple languages mixed in it. Only us can mm. understand. So we're creating our own language as well. <laughs> mm. yeah. yeah, I don't know. Um, do we still have time? Um, so yeah, I want to make a final comment. So school learning um, is primarily explicit, especially the way it is taught languages, uh, language classes are taught currently. Um, it's primarily explicit and um, certainly um, that kind of teaching or instruction draws on explicit aptitude um, and not implicit aptitude. So um, um, there, uh, implicit learning needs to be recognized and um, um, teachers should uh, at least mi mix up different kinds of approach, different kinds of instruction to accommodate learners with um, different cognitive profiles or different cognitive strengths. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lee, for your wonderful talk and everyone for their questions. Um, stay tuned for information for next month's talk from Dr. Sherry Sutherland. We'll be circulating Zoom information and registration information as well. So thank you all and stay safe and well. Thank, thank, you, very you, much. thank you, Dr. Lee. Appreciate it. Bye. Great presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Bye, Amal. Thank you.